This is my teddy bear. Um, this went with me everywhere where I was young. Um, I'll just stick him up there if he's going to... No, he's not very good at sitting up straight. Um, when I was young, Teddy went with me everywhere. When we were going on holiday, Teddy went with me. Uh, when I was, you know, we were going to see a friend or going to a friend's house, Teddy went with me. Um, everywhere I went, he went too. And he was like this constant, loving, supportive presence. Um, and then I went off to boarding school and Teddy didn't go with me. Uh, Teddy stayed firmly at home because I, I knew what was good for me. Um, <laughs> but a few other things did go with me. Um, I had a, uh, a What Would Jesus Do wristband. Anyone remember those? WWJD sort of thing written on my wrist. Um, I had a wooden holding cross uh, that I had in my pocket that was sort of good to hold in the hand. Um, and I had, um, I had a big Bible, but I also had this small Bible, which is um, just a New Testament. And this fit nicely in my blazer pocket at school. So whenever I was wandering around school, I had that in my pocket. And these were all things that I began to realize what I was really looking for was that sense of God being with me. They were all kind of signs or symbols of what I really wanted, which was to know that God was right next to me as I was going into my everyday, into the different situations of life. And I began praying, God, would you show me that you're with me? Would I know that deep in my heart? Would I feel it, experience it? And I began to, I began to become so much more aware that when I was going into things, God was there with me. And I wonder if we're like that. I wonder how many of us have um, things we carry around with us, maybe a piece of jewellery or maybe a photograph or maybe a Bible or a cross. All those things that we take with us uh, into the different situations of life and often what we really want is to know God with us. Um, So this morning um, we're going to be thinking about that, about how do we take God's presence with us into the different situations of life. Um, We started this series on the promises of God last week. Uh, Tim spoke about how we stand on the promises of God, that we're all looking for something to build our lives on. And actually, we do build our lives on something, whether we realize it or not, whether that's our stuff and the things we have, or if it's uh, the current trends of thinking and philosophies, or if it's our jobs and careers, we all build our lives on things. And actually, what we really want to be doing is building our lives on God's promises. Because when storms come, when difficulties in life come, we begin to realize that actually the other stuff just doesn't do it. It doesn't cut it. You know, we realize that our stuff won't really satisfy us. We realize that our jobs are great, but you know, that they're not going to plug the gaps that we feel, those holes we feel when things go really badly in life and things are really difficult. So this morning we're going to look at the promise of God's presence. Uh, And this um, promise we're going to look at, why does Jesus promise his presence? You know, why? Why is that one of the promises? Um, What exactly is the presence of God? What do we mean when we talk about that? Uh, And then finally, what are some of the things that kind of stop us from knowing God's presence? uh, And how do we get over those things? So those are sort of our three points for today. So... Why does Jesus promise his presence? You know, why? When we look at this passage today in Matthew, uh, it's taken from the end of Matthew's gospel, and for the disciples, it's definitely a stormy time in their lives. This is the point at which Jesus has died. Everything that they have pinned their lives on for the previous three years has suddenly gone the foundations, all that they were building their lives on, this sense of, you know, there's this teacher, there's this leader, we're hoping for something, and suddenly he's dead. And they must have been totally shattered and struggling. And then they hear that he's risen. You know, what? And the women are coming and saying, you know, you need to go to Galilee, he's going to meet you. So they go to Galilee, and they suddenly find that he really is risen, he really is there. And what's more, he's saying to them, I will always be with you. Surely I will be with you always, even to the end of the age. Why does Jesus give them this promise? Well, what were they up to before he gave that promise? They were hiding. They were frightened. They were terrified. They weren't going out and doing anything he told them to do. He realized that they really needed his presence. 
And they were going to need it even more now that he gave them this new mission, this new commission. We talk about this passage as the Great Commission. Go out and make, na- make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to observe everything I have commanded you. They're going to need God's presence for that, because I don't know about you, but that sounds like a little bit of a challenge. Go out to the whole world and make disciples of everyone, teach them to obey everything I have commanded and baptize them. You know, gosh, you know, sometimes I struggle to get you know, up and out in the mornings. Um, how on earth are we going to do this? Um, and you know, sometimes we, we need that, that sense of the presence of God. We need to be reminded of that in our mornings. Um, when we were back in East London, uh, one of the vicars in the neighboring parish um, had this, you know, he used to tell us that he would get up in the mornings and sit in his prayer chair and he wouldn't leave until he you know, was reminded and knew that God was with him, that he had that sense of the presence of God, of the Holy Spirit filling him. And we were like, what did you do about meetings? You know, what happens if you've got a meeting at 9 a.m.? You just miss it? Because, and then what do, you, you know, what do you say? I know that for some of us, that's not going to be an option. You know, we've got to be at work at 9.30 or, or whatever. Um, but there was something amazing about saying, you know, God, I need you with me. And acknowledging that dependence on God in the morning and saying, Lord, would you come? Would you fill me? Would I experience you? Would I know you deep in my heart this morning before... Uh, we get on to the first thing that we're doing. So that's why Jesus gave that promise, because he knows that we need his presence. Without him, the disciples were hiding, they were afraid, they were away from the world. But with his presence, they were going to be able to go out and fulfill that commission. So what exactly is the presence of God? And I want to talk a little bit this morning about this, because I think this is really important for us to understand. First and foremost, the presence of God is a promise. Jesus in this passage says to his disciples, surely I will be with you always, even to the end of the age. Now we're going to talk a bit about how we can feel and experience the presence of God this morning. But fundamentally, this is a promise before it is a feeling. Um, To illustrate this, um, we all know that gravity is a thing. You know, gravity exists, otherwise we'd all be floating around the room and it would be very difficult to keep the chairs straight and in line. But we're not always totally conscious of gravity, are we? Most of the time we probably don't really think about it that much. But if I start running up and down these steps as quickly as I can, or doing box jumps or something, pretty soon I'm going to start actually fall over, but um, pretty soon I'm going to start feeling that in my legs. I'm going to start feeling the lactic acid build up. My legs are going to get heavy. I'm going to feel it. But that doesn't mean it wasn't there when I wasn't running up and down those steps. Something with the presence of God. The presence of God is a promise to us. God is going to be with us always if we are his disciples. And sometimes we will feel that in a very tangible way. But if we don't, it doesn't mean he's gone. Um, When I was at university um, in Durham, I had a time when I thought that God had totally left me. Um, It was a kind of crisis of faith for 24 hours where um, I'd had a really difficult conversation with a couple of friends. Uh, They'd grown up in church, but they didn't really believe it. And they were asking me all kinds of questions about the Bible that I didn't have a clue how to answer. And um, I just ended that conversation feeling quite discouraged. And I began questioning, you know, do I really believe this? What's going on? And I suddenly felt like I had this real void um, where God had been. And I had this crisis of faith, and I was thinking, you know, I'm leading in the Christian Union. How am I going to tell them that, you know, I'm not sure about any of this stuff? I played in a band at church. How am I going to tell them? You know, you start sort of thinking, how am I going to get out of all this? Um, And anyway, the following day was a Sunday, and I went to church, and after the sermon, I went up to be prayed for. I thought, you know, heck, I'll give it one last try. And as I was prayed for, um, my pastor came up and uh, gave me a massive hug and then said, now wait because God is going to speak to you. So I'm standing there waiting, trying to keep my head clear, trying to not think, oh, this is pointless. And suddenly these words just came to mind out of nowhere. I will never leave you nor forsake you. And I realized pretty quickly that I don't say forsake in my head to myself. That's not the kind of word. I don't go around speaking 18th century English to myself. Um, I don't say that to myself. I knew that was God. 
I knew without a shadow of a doubt, never will I leave you nor forsake you. And at that moment, I didn't even realize that was in the Bible. <laughs> um, it was only later that I realized when reading Hebrews through, I found it in Hebrews chapter 13, verse 5, and it comes from Deuteronomy, where, Jesus, where, where God says to his people, I will never leave you nor forsake you, Deuteronomy 31, verse 6. And so actually, had God left me when I felt like he'd left me? No, he hadn't. He'd been with me all along, and he spoke into that and said, no, I will never leave you nor forsake you. So when we feel like God has gone, he's, he's still there. At the end of the day, it, does, it doesn't depend on what we feel, it depends on what he's promised. And he's promised that he will be with us always. I think the other drawback of sometimes thinking you know, that it's all about the feeling of the presence of God is that we can become quite inward. So we can come on Sundays and we can have amazing times of worship and go, wasn't the presence of God powerful? And then we forget about the commission bit of going out. You know, I've fallen into this so many times. You, know, you come to church and you get really excited. Presence of God. And then we go. And we forget that Jesus gives this promise in the context of go and make disciples of all nations and surely I will be with you. He makes the promise of when two or three gather, I will be with you. That's true. But when we go, he will also be with us. And I think there's, when we go out and share what we find in Christ, when we go out and share the difference that he makes to our lives, we can find that actually he shows up in really surprising ways. Um, when I was a teenager, I did a mission trip with my youth group from church. And we worked with this organization in London called the Beesum. Anyone heard of the Beesum? Um, fantastic charity that um, actors, they call themselves a bridge, they t- um, kind of, I was going to say, they take from the rich and give to the poor. Um, that's Robin Hood. Uh, the Beesum, um, they find people who want to give really good quality things and they then uh, get in touch with the council and find out who's in need and then they take those things along. Um, so um, me and my friend uh, Jamie, uh, we went along with this guy called Dave who was the driver And uh, he drove this van, and we went to a council estate in Battersea, and we took this guy, Barry, a fridge. So, you know, we we just wheeled this fridge in, and this guy had nothing. You know, he slept on two uh, sofa cushions. Um, He had barely any furniture. He had a radio, a bike. That was about it. And um, we gave him this fridge, and he was immensely grateful. And then Dave, the guy leading we were with, said, you know, can we pray for you? Um, and we prayed for him. And the, the sense of the presence of God as we prayed for that guy was incredible. It was so powerful. And he just started weeping and you know, was incredibly overcome. And when, we, when Jamie and I left, we were just on the biggest high, you know, both of us. We were like, oh my goodness, you know, did you see what God did, how he turned up? It was amazing. And we were like, we just want to do this for the rest of our lives. Stuff school, we want to come and join the Beeson full time. Um, It is amazing when we go out and share our faith, when we take those opportunities to pray for people, when we take the opportunity to tell them that on Sunday morning we went to church and God did this, how God can show up. Because Jesus says, you know, when you go, I will be with you. And I really, that's something that really encourages me, that when I'm going to go and pray for someone or share something, you know, it might look like it's falling flat on its face, but God is with us, and he will use it, and there will be something good that comes out of it, even if, you know, on outward appearance, it feels difficult or challenging. So what hinders our awareness of God's presence? And there are three things I want us to think about. Uh, first is circumstances, you know, the circumstances of life, difficulties, storms. Uh, the second thing that we often just forget... <laughs> You know, we forget about God in our day-to-day lives. Um, and thirdly, um, kind of willful disobedience is what I've called it. But, you know, that sense of when we know that God doesn't want us to do something and then we go and do it. Um, so firstly, circumstances, um, suffering. Sometimes we go through times of suffering and so we can't understand how God is present with us because if he was present, then would we really be going through this? But this is probably the best answer I feel like I've found for the question of suffering. The answer being that God is with us in our suffering. God suffers with us, and yet he can bring hope out of that suffering too. Because that's exactly what happened at the cross. 
Jesus was present in the world. He suffered with the world, and then he overcame it. And this, it's throughout Scripture, the promise of, you know, be, I, I am with you is often in the context of following the words, do not be afraid. You know, do not be afraid, do not be discouraged, for I am the Lord your God, and I will go with you wherever you go. Yes, Joshua. When I was um, 15, uh, my mum was diagnosed with breast cancer uh, for the second time. Um, and I was at school, and I went and met up with a guy who was uh, older than me and had sort of been mentoring me. And we just prayed together that morning afterwards, where I was a bit kind of shell-shocked. It's like, gosh, it's back. Um, and we prayed together. Um, we both sort of boarded, and it was in his boarding house. And um, as we prayed, I remember in my head saying to God, you know, God, if you were here, what would you say right now? You know, what would your answer be for this? And similar to my other experience, without really thinking or anything, some words came really fluently into my head, which were, I'm here, I love you, I have a plan. And kind of blew my mind. I actually skipped back to my next thing at school because I was so, it was so profound. I knew that that was God. I knew that he had spoken to me and he had said, I'm here, I love you, I have a plan. And that's... We, we suddenly remember when we have those experiences of God's presence, the, the other promises, that he's, he loves us, that he has a plan for us, that he is with us. And that was true then, and it was still true on the morning that my mum then died. We, had, we read morning prayer together, um, and um, the words from Isaiah chapter 43 uh, were in morning prayer. And it's uh, this, this, a, a little extract from it. Do not fear, for I have redeemed you. I have called you by name. You are mine. When you pass through the waters, I will be with you. And through the rivers, they shall not overwhelm you. When you walk through the fire, you shall not be burned, and the flames shall not consume you. For I am the Lord your God, the Holy One of Israel, your Redeemer. And over the next couple of days, we had three different people come up to us at random and say, I just really felt that God was prompting me to share these verses with you. I don't know if they're significant for you. Um, God was so with us in that time. It was a time of immense pain and difficulty. But God was with us undeniably. And that gives us such hope, doesn't it? Because actually if God's still with us and if he still loves us and if he's still in control, then somehow, even in the midst of all that, there is hope. There is still a sense that he is with us and he hasn't abandoned us. And I think that's what we see a bit in today's reading. You know, these disciples' lives were turned totally upside down by Jesus dying, and yet he steps back in and says, surely I will be with you always, and gives them a hope for the future. The second thing uh, that can hinder us is this sense of forgetting. Um, So when I was a... I used to work in a local authority before going off to train to be a vicar, and um, I would often try and somehow set reminders about God throughout the day. So I would have, um, I had a digital watch which had an hour chime thing, so you can set it so it beeps every hour, um, just once, which isn't too awkward if you're in a meeting or it's, you know, a silent moment. Um, And it was just to try and remind me to sort of pray or just remember God in my day. And I think that, you know, God wants us to do the whole of life with him. Sometimes we relegate him to Sundays and then go, you know, I'll see you next week. Whereas actually, God is with us throughout the whole week, even in the really tedious stuff, even in the commuting, even in the boring meetings. God is with us and wants us to be doing life with him in those things. Um, There's a famous uh, book called The Practice of the Presence of God uh, by a guy called Brother Lawrence. Anyone read it or come across it? Yeah. It's a great book. It's a bit old English, but it's about a guy, um, a monk, who essentially washed pots in a kitchen and about how he came to be always doing it aware of God's presence. Uh, and I love that, and I really want to kind of, I'm not there yet, but I'm trying to sort of, you know, get after that and say, Lord, how do I bring you into every bit of my life so that no matter what I'm doing, I'm aware of you and I'm doing it with you? I think that's, if we can find ways of doing that, I think that, that's great. Um, and one of the things that I think can sometimes stop us with that is, when we get ourselves, you know, we, we find ourselves troubled or anxious or worried, um, I feel like sometimes my first response can be to get my phone out and just try and sort of ignore it. Um, you know, we, these things are great for anaesthetizing ourselves, aren't they? If there's something's come up, you know, the first place it goes. Um, 
And um, I don't know if anyone's seen this week, um, Apple have just released their screen time setting so you can see how much time you've spent on your phone. It's quite a frightening experience. Um, I thought I was fairly good. Um, but you know, there, if we can try and not have those things as the first things we go to, but how can it be that we, the first thing we go to is God? You know, the first thing we go to is actually prayer uh, when those things come up. How do we remind ourselves throughout the day that God is with us and wants us to include him? And finally, um, kind of when we just, just don't want God, you know, they, what are called willful disobedience, you know, when we know that God doesn't really want us to do something, and yet we do it anyway. And being slightly brutally honest here, I'm not sure there's anything more destructive to our awareness of the presence of God than doing exactly the opposite of what God wants us to do. When we, and when we know it, you know, those times when it's like, I know that I shouldn't really be doing this, but I'm going to do it anyway. Um, there's an American pastor called Bill Johnson who uses this great illustration of a dove. Um, a dove in the Bible is you know, probably you know, a symbol of the Holy Spirit. So um, often when Jesus was baptized and the Holy Spirit descended like a dove on him. And Bill Johnson uses this illustration of saying the presence of God can be thought of like a dove that sits on our shoulder. And what we want to do is whatever we can to make sure the dove doesn't fly away. Um, and I think that when we do exactly the opposite of what we want, of what we know God wants us to do, it's like we basically just punch the dove off. You know, it's not even subtle. It's, you know, get lost. I don't want you here. Um, but yet, in the same breath, let me say this. There is nothing uh, better for our awareness of God than heartfelt repentance. There will be nothing that brings us back to God quicker than when we turn around to him and say Sorry. And Tim was preaching on the prodigal son um, last week in the evening service. And there's that wonderful image of the son who repents and turns and goes back to his father. And the minute he's in view, the father is running off the porch, diving towards this son, hugging him, clothing him in a ring and a robe. There is, whilst there might be nothing that takes us away from the presence of God more quickly than willfully doing the wrong thing, there is nothing that brings us back quicker than turning and repenting. So, what will we take with us this week when we go into our daily lives? Um, Teddy's obviously been here for the entirety of this uh, talk, um, even though I've been fairly unaware of him at times. Um, and I think, you know, just that remembrance that I want to experience and feel the presence of God 24-7. But in those moments when I don't, it's about what God has promised and not about what I feel. It's about the fact that God is with me, even if I don't necessarily in those moments feel it. So I just want to encourage you, if, if the whole thing of feeling the presence of God is a bit alien to you this morning, know that God is with you. And where there are circumstances that distract us or challenge us from knowing God's presence, or we are wrestling to let go of things that we know that God really would rather we didn't do. God is still with us. He never leaves. He never takes a day off. I love Psalm 121 that says he doesn't slumber or sleep. His presence is a promise. It's more than a feeling. And so my prayer is that we take this promise with us tomorrow when we go into our daily lives, that we have that awareness, that remembrance that God is with us. We spend time in the morning going, Lord, show me your presence. Help me know your presence. Help me remember your presence. In those moments where life is really tough, we look for God's presence, we reach out. Because we will find it, because he is there. <laughs>